Oh, what a double dose of goodness we have for you this week. First, we have the ultimate Bassmaster behind the scenes show with Bassmaster videographer himself, Jake Latondris, and Jake's take. As if that's not enough, we're also joined by two time Bassmaster Elite Series champion, current leader in Dakota Lithium Rookie of the Year race, sitting in sixth place in a progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year race with just two events to go. None other than the, 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 the cowboy, Joey Cifuentes. This week on. I'm Bob Cobb for the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all, friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. You're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. And uh, this version, the first show in August, I think I say this every month, hard to believe how quick... The summer is flying past, um, but what a tournament we had last week. And that's one of the reasons that my voice sounds a little more raspy, a little more smoky-toned, because I've been yelling and screaming about bass fishing for the last few weeks, and the anglers gave me lots to yell and scream about on Lake St. Clair. And what an event. I mean, a new venue, Brandenburg Park, where we normally had gone out of Metro, and uh, Brandenburg Park was awesome. Um, top end of Anchor Bay. And it just was part of a community. You know what I mean? Like there was just so much support. Like the event went from being this event that we've had over the years and had great events. But it just kind of felt like we were an event that was just one event of many in in a big city where... This new location was awesome. I mean, state-of-the-art park, incredible crowd. I couldn't believe how loud they were. I mean, they were big. Um, I believe maybe our biggest weigh-in crowds we've had at Lake St. Clair. Um, But, man, they were loud. Like, it took nothing to get them to pop. And I thank each and every one of you for that. And I can't wait till we head back there again. Um, One of the highlights for me this week was... um, Getting to work with Z again. Um, obviously, last week's guest on this particular show, but Mark Zona from Zona's Awesome Fishing Show and um, one of my closest friends on this entire planet. And we work together every week at Elite Series events, but he's normally at his home studio or he's normally in the studio in Little Rock, Arkansas, but we're not standing side by side. That's how this all started for me, is working with Zona and Tommy and all of us being at events. So it was honestly um, not just professionally, like as far as it was fun to work with Z that end, but personally I thought this week was very therapeutic. I don't know. For me, it was just like, man, this is, this is just one of the many things I love about this job. And uh, Zona is incredibly talented when it comes to color commentary. I went on and on about it last week and how I feel about him and Tommy together and how great they are. I just feel like our sport is lucky to have them and um, lucky to have the dude as a friend. I'm thankful for many things he's done to help me in life. And and one of those is obviously getting me this job at Bass. So, um, or that job at Bass, I guess this job is, is at the podcast, which, which, well, really it's just me, you, and you guys gave me this job. Um, so I thank you for making this job not seem foolish and showing up here each and every week. And I thank Mark Zona for being the person he is. I mean, everybody loved Karen Zona because she showed up and introduced the world to crumble cookies, which we had, I had never had, but they're like a $6 cookie and uh, they bought a lot of them. So thank you. Thank you very much. I ate very few of them, but I, well, I, I ate a couple. Um, but yeah, no, great weekend, great tournament. Awesome Champion Joey Cifuentes wins his second Elite Series title in 2023, his rookie season. He is in contention to win Rookie of the Year and Angler of the Year, which is unheard of. Um, I think the last person to ever do it would have been Timmy Horton. That was previous to the Elite Series, so it's never happened in Elite Series competition, but I think Timmy Horton did it in 2000, but I don't believe we actually had an official Rookie of the Year award at that time, but still... An incredible accomplishment and uh, an incredible situation that Joey Fuentes has put himself in going into uh, 
Just two events left to finish off the 2023 Bassmaster Elite Series season. So thank you, Mark Zona, for a great week. Congratulations, Joey Sifuentes. And you guys know what happens after every single Elite Series event. We have my boy Jake Latondris on here, the tenderness, uh, with Jake's take, where we break down all the action. He was with um, Chris Zaldane on day one, which will be great stuff. He was with Jason Christie on day two, more great stuff. And then he spent day three and day four with Takumi Ito in small Moat Disneyland. Um, so lots of great stuff coming up. First, we're going to talk to Jake, and then we'll bring in Joey Sifuentes. And um, I think it'll be a pretty good podcast. So it's going to be a long one. I mean, they're, they're all long, and there's lots to cover here. So break it up into a couple of bits if you need to. But I'm just thankful that you guys come here each and every week. And without further ado, let's get dug. Let's get stuck in to Jake's take with Jake Latondres. Jake's take is back in your life. And Jake, what a freaking tournament we had this past weekend on Lake St. Clair. Unbelievable. How many 20 pound bags were there? Over a hundred? Oh yeah. Way over. I think it was like 114 or something like that. Biggest winning weight ever there. Um, on day one, we 90, had 91 30, pounds. Yeah. 91 and change. I think the record before was 89 and change. Um, the guy really got screwed in that record chase is Seth fighter. Cause he had like 77 after three days. That dude has twice both of his wins. Cause I believe Malax was 75 pounds too. He was twice on pace to break a hundred pounds before anybody had ever broken a hundred pounds of smallmouth bass. But they were three day derbies. It kind of feels like a Seth Fighter thing to do. <laughs> right. I, I, go ahead. Incredible. Yeah. Like 33 20 pound bags day one, 48 on day two. Um, day three, we only have 50 anglers. We had 28 20 pound bags that day. And I don't even know how many on the final day, but it, it, it was quite a few. I didn't, I mean, that would have been the easiest day to count, but. If I was better at this job, I would have. But I mean, stupid dude, stupid, stupid. Um, stupid. And in weight. July, in late July, at that, I mean, those those fish were skinny. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Had we had that tournament in in May or something, it would have been a completely different, like crushed a hundred pounds. What if we have that tournament where we normally have it a month from now? You know what I mean? But just right. one month from now, all those skinny fish get a lot less skinny. But then. The question is, does Anchor Bay play the way it has? Because, dude, that that's the other thing. Like, that never plays. Like, Anchor Bay is, you know what I mean? Yes, Bill Widener won there last time. And I've seen Chris um, Chris Lane had a, you know, caught a bunch of big fish there um, one year. Not the year he won. The year he won, he won up on Huron. But, I mean, Anchor Bay is kind of never been the big player. You know, there's a handful of boats. Like, so much so that I was talking to a buddy of mine, Minnie, that lives there. And we were laughing after the win. We're like, Anchor Bay dominated this event in every spot but the win. <clears throat> but I remember like six years ago being there for an event and Minnie was taking people from Bass Pro Shops, you know, Rick Emmett and stuff like that, fishing during the tournament. And they were like, oh, we can't go in turmoil. She's like, we're going to Anchor Bay. Nobody goes there. That's how, how you know, right, Anchor right. Bay has played up to this point. But it was everything this time. The fish were just bigger there than elsewhere. And, and, and my question is, why is that? Because there were, I don't know how many boats, I don't know how many boats were at Anchor Bay all four days. Well, we know how many were there on day four, but day one, two, and three, especially one and two, it was insane. It looked like one of those spots where, you know, everyone stops at the local bait shop and says, Hey man, where are the walleyes biting? And the guy at the bait shop tells everyone to go to anchor Bay. And there's all these boats out there, you know, drifting with leeches, catching walleyes. That's what it reminded me of. And the times that we did run to Canada, I ran to Canada with Zaldane. He actually spent quite a bit of time in Canada. I ran to, um, Canada with Jason Christie and I actually ran over there I think one or two times with Taku on day three and the fish are just smaller and so the bait and and as we all know now I mean everybody had crawdad parts you know in their live well after each day it, I mean is that what their primary forage base is in there crawdads I think <clears throat> And excuse my voice, I'm a little raspy from the weekend. Um, I think that, I mean, I know that Lake St. Clair has always been that way. It is 100% all about what they're eating. 
I mean, and and some of the most fun fish to catch on Lake St. Clair, if you're out for a fun day fishing, are the mayfly sippers. You hear them out there. If you're catching those and somebody else is catching a perch eater, you cannot compete. Like it, it's as much as three quarter a pound per fish that that person will have over you if you're if you're weighing in mayfly fish. Um, and obviously they were eating a lot of crawdads, crayfish, Perch. crawfish, what, whatever you call them, because you can see the orange. Actually, if you look at some of the pictures, dude, there was, it's like a redfish. They get the iodine in them. So definitely flamingos was, do the same thing with crustaceans. Yeah. 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 Flamingos. Of course. I bet you had yeah. a pet flamingo growing up, didn't you? <laughs> They're actually white birds that turn pink when they eat the, the krill and shrimp. Yeah. Yeah, and and they get dyed pink in zoos, I believe. Like they put they pink dye, it's, in a, their, it's horrible. That's a totally different pink, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's always been bait driven, and the bigger bait with the better what they wanted was there. But I do have a weird theory about the whole crawfish thing, and I mean this is unscientific or anything like that. But I think that everybody's like, oh, they're spitting up crawfish. They're spitting up. That's all they were eating they have a harder time digesting crawfish than anything else. Like, you know, you'll hear a lot of guys say, well, I just don't see them spitting up gobies in my life. Well, well, because that's a much easier thing to, to digest. digest. You know, there's parts right. of the crawfish they can't digest those little balls that end up in your live well and stuff like that. So, but long story short, the bigger fish were in anchor Bay this time around. And after day one, clearly that got out. That's why we had uh, 33, 20 pound bags on day one. And you think it's going to get a little worse in day two. But we had more on day two, 48 on day two, because uh, more people started fishing there, maybe. And maybe that was because they stopped there on the way in, you know, after the run back, caught some fish and went out or who knows why. But there was more people there and uh, it looked like Anchor Bay was going to dominate the tournament. But in the end, the cowboy rides over to Canada where most people normally fish in this event and and gets it done. Um a wild event, a wild event. Um, but let's start day one, Chris Aldane. Yep, Chris right. Aldane. We went straight to, I believe we went, uh, we stopped for a short period on one of his best spots. And then it wasn't happening there. So we ran over to Canada and spent quite a bit of time there. And I always like running with Zaldane. He's got, you know, energy. We have the same kind of energy. I get all, I get jacked up, man. I mean, I know I'm just a camera guy and I'm in the back of the boat. I'm supposed to stay neutral and all that stuff, but I feel like I'm in the tournament and whoever, you know, whoever I'm riding with, I mean, I'm for that person. Cause I like to win. I'm a competitive guy myself. So, you know, we were, and I was filming uh, the boat ride out with Zaldane already knowing that I was going to use Kiss's Detroit Rock City as the soundtrack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, and, and the boat was bouncing just right to make that uh, video cool. But anyway, I always, I always love going out with Zaldane. Um, I think, uh, you know, I've, I've been in his boat, especially since the flip. And when he first started, I met him up, up on the upper Mississippi, that tournament that Ish Monroe won. And ever since then, Chris and I have always gotten along. So he's always, you know, he's very knowledgeable about what he's doing. He's very interpretive when he's on live uh, and, and talking about what he's doing. And um, but I don't think he was doing anything different than anyone else. He just wasn't on the same fish that the other people were. And I think he stayed away from anchor Bay because he's one of those guys that likes to get out and do his own thing. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so how did they go? Um, I think he weighed, he came back and weighed, I think it was 18 pounds and he was kind of like, well, that wasn't that, you know, he salvaged it there in the end. He caught some bigger fish and upgraded towards the end of the day when that afternoon bite started. And then, you know, we rolled in, I'm thinking, hey, that's not too bad. He's got like 18 pounds. And I'm looking at bass track and, you know, all the sandbags, uh, sandbagging that goes on there. And then all of a sudden he gets to the scale and weighs, I forget what his exact weight was, but it was, I believe it was in the eighteens and he's like in, you know, 60th place or whatever it was. <laughs> it's like, Holy crap. Yeah. That was, it was ridiculous, dude. Like I'll be honest. There's a lot of small mouth term. I love my job. I don't ever want another. I mean, I, I am very happy in my job, but there, when we go to places like that, that you have a lot of history on, you're like, man, I, I, if I could throw my hat in one, I'd like to fish this one. I swear to you 
all they kept going through my mind on day one is like, yeah, no, I just, I don't ever want to fish against these guys. I don't, I don't ever, because it's, <laughs> it was stupid. Like Bill Lowen had 22 pounds and change and he wasn't in the top 10. It was, right. it was ridiculous. And the crazy thing is going into that event, dude, the locals and people were like, it might be a little tougher. I mean, they're a little off, you know, it's a time of year and stuff like that, but clearly they were not. Um, they caught them, dude. I mean, they caught them good. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, one of the things about uh, forward facing sonar that I learned in this event is how different it is when they're finding fish in the sand and how different it is when they're finding fish in the grass. And one of the things that I've learned is how they tend to pull those fish out of the grass with baits, but like, you know, I don't, we can get to Jason Christie in a minute, but you know, he was throwing a huge three quarter ounce tube jig oh, and he yeah. was ripping, he was ripping that thing over the top of the grass and those fish were coming up out of the grass, but he couldn't see the fish cause they're buried in the grass and then they're coming back up after it. So then he would raise the fish and then he would, he would reel it in and, and cast back over them and just crank, like run it like a crankbait over the top of those fish. And boom, he was catching them. It was pretty cool. I learned a, I learned a ton about forward facing sonar um, in this event more so than what I think we've learned over the past, you know, whatever two years that it's really uh, uh, become part of the game. And this was one of those deals where there's no structure, there's no rocks, there's it's just sand and grass, and and it's it was a different ball game because of that. I felt like. I think what you just hit on was was one of the sneaky players in this event. There was doesn't matter the depth depth of water you're fishing. I mean, St. Clair's a generally a shallow lake. I mean, its average depth is 11 feet. I think its deepest point is like 27 feet. Mm -hmm. But this much under the water from the surface played a big player for some key bites in this tournament. You know, and we and there was a bunch of anglers, whether they were on camera or not, that, that I saw moments that that which that explains St. Clair. I mean, they, they're the most inquisitive. I mean, they fought. If your boat passes you on St. Clair, you always cast at it. You know what I mean? Because those fish, they chase. And um, what Christy, Christy's done so well on a tube there, snapping a tube over the years. I mean, which is one of the most puzzling things in the elite series right now. Me and Zona were blown away by it, but he's like, he told me a story about Takumi Ito, who we're going to talk about a bunch here in a little bit. And he said Takumi stayed at his house last year for a few days. Um, number one, a ferocious appetite. Would eat steak and always <laughs> demand desserts. Um, <laughs> Zona, I mean, Zona can eat a half a cat. Like, he, I mean, that man ingests a lot of hardly cooked protein. Beef. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, he was impressed with how much Takumi could eat. But here's one of the things that blew me away. Zona, just like me, has an incredible, like, I mean, I don't know. How many Plano boxes I got full of tubes? A dozen, probably, um, from over the years. Small ones, bigger ones, different. Zona's the same. I mean, Zona maybe more. And Zona has tons of different tube heads and stuff like that. Takumi, when he was at his house, went walked up. He said, "Why?" And Zona's like, "You don't throw a tube, no." And Zona's like, "Would well, you want some?" He's like, "No, too big. I, you know, I don't want." He doesn't throw a tube. And then we got on this topic. It's amazing. More bass have been caught in a tube jig than any other bait in Lake St. Clair. But it is amazing the amount of elite series pros. And I maybe it's a generational thing. You know, there's been a lot of hype around a lot of things. And a tube's kind of not got as much hype over the last number of years. But how often do you see a tube playing throughout the year? Dude, never. I mean, when Weird. Jason Christie... I knew I knew he had hit his history there with tube jigs uh, and the success he's had, but really, you know, the tube that he was throwing with a three quarter ounce ball headed jig on it looks ridiculous. Really, I mean, after all these years of seeing these new baits and the new molds come out with all kinds of different plastic options that you have to mimic, you know, the natural forage base in the lake, why does a tube jig do so well? And I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it, it looked ridiculous really, but he was, he did it and he, he did really well. And he could have, had he been, you know, 
shifted a little bit had there not been as many boats and he could have gone where he wanted to when he wanted to at certain times of the day making different decisions Jason Christie could have been in the top 10 easily and because he was catching them and you know that afternoon bite on day two I think he had like probably 16 and a half pounds or something like that with an hour to go and he goes to his last spot closer to the ramp and you know there's hardly anyone out there because it's sort of getting late in the day and everyone shifted uh uh to a, a different spot at anchor bay and he's throwing that tube jig and he's ripping it across that grass and he upgrades three fish in the last hour and ends up weighing 199 on day two, which gets him, you know, moves him up the boards and puts him in position to actually make a run at a top 10 on day three. It, it was pretty cool to watch. He, I, I, man, he's a lot of times he's quiet. He's the intimidator. He's Jason Christie. He's a very serious angler. You know, when you're in the boat with him and even with my history with him, I love the guy to death. I'm pretty quiet in the boat with him because he's so mentally focused and he doesn't like distractions. He doesn't like, you know, hearing I, I'm scared to eat crackers around him when he's fishing. Cause I'm scared <laughs> that the, the noise of eating crackers is going to distract him, but he is so interesting to be in the boat with because when things are going wrong, he figures it out. He's a very, very, very good fisherman as we all know. An incredible angler and and he had a good finish. I mean, needs to have a few good finishes to tail end of the season. I mean, it was weird too. I said it on live and it wasn't a slight on Christy, but I said there's a little part of me that it's nice to see Christy stressed because outside, literally outside of the stress of I need to win a Bassmaster Classic, which he exercised two years ago. When's the last time you saw Jason Christie in that situation? You know what I mean? Like the Bassmaster Classic is coming to his home state and there's three he events to, to go and he's outside of the cut. Um, I believe he's inside the cut now with this finish. I haven't he actually is, yeah. checked, but if he isn't, he, so he is. Do you know what the place yeah. he's in? I, I don't, but I was check on day, I, on day three, I was checking, uh, the leaderboard and I was looking at the AOI standings and he's well inside the cut. Now I'm pretty sure you, you'd have to verify that. But I when I saw it, I was like, Oh yeah. Okay. He just needs to have two more good events, pretty good events, make the cut uh, two more times um, up in uh, Champlain and St. Lawrence. And he's in for sure. Currently in 37th place right now. There you go. Um, so yeah, inside the cut, pretty it's... comfortable, but <laughs> yeah, can I mean, go well. With two events left, things are going to go well for some people, and things are going to go really bad for some people. Well, and in the north, and we saw it this time, things can go, you can catch them and not catch them. I mean, Zaldane, prime example, what you talked about. I mean, Zaldane's incredible, an incredible, incredible smallmouth angler. fisherman especially. Um, has a great track record there, and I would have been just like him, idling in on that day, thinking I have 18. Okay, well, I'm not winning this tournament but I'm going to be in the cut and I'm going to have a shot to charge up a little bit, but to that can happen on Champlain. And that can also happen on thousand islands where we're going for the last event. Like that's, what's scary about the North. Like it, it feels like everyone catches them and everybody it's like social media versus real life and social media. Like if you post a picture of you holding the fish that Zaldane caught on day one, I mean, you look like a champ on social media. But right. when you go to weigh in, it's kind of like real life where you're like, ah, oops. Right. So, um, but I, I hope Christy gets, um, keeps catching him. I would imagine he does. I mean, Champlain sets up for him in multiple ways. Multiple ways. Yeah. And I think he finished 20 something, um, last time we were at St. Lawrence river. So I think he's, uh, yeah, I, I would expect Christy to be in the classic. I mean, we can't go to Oklahoma without Christy. So yeah, I was just gonna say, man. I mean, and it's always cool to have it set up for an anticipating a back-to-back -back win because that's so rare with you know Rick and KVD and and Jordan Lee and Hank Cherry. That's such a small group of you know elite anglers that have done that. And having Jason at Grand Lake um, for the for the uh, Bassmaster Classic. I mean, it would be a travesty not to have him there. We got it. We got to have that. What does that have to do with a back-to-back -back win? Oh, I'm just confused. Oh, Are you oh, forgetting? Duh. You forgetting so Jeff sorry. Gustafson? I, I, I'm so sorry. I forgot about Gussie. Oh wow. my God! Wow. Forgive me, Gussie. I'm so sorry. That was a brain fart, <laughs> and that I, one stunk. I, 
and here's honestly the battle uh. of hosting a podcast. I'm just going to be honest. Mm -hmm. If we were on Bass Live, I would have ignored it and just moved on. But Bass <laughs> Live doesn't have a comment section. And if I don't, somebody is going to call us out because um, people people like to do that. But oh, I um, can't believe I just said that. I left hey. skid marks. Uh, all good. <laughs> we're all good. Um, so Zaldane had a tough tournament, obviously. I'd hate to rush on from him. Um, but I, I would imagine Zaldane to be a player in the next few. I mean, he has to be to finish off a season. I mean, he's always a player, it feels like in Thousand Islands. Um, and, and I also feel like I think we're learning more and more that literally, like with Joey winning and how often we see it happen, anybody can be a player. You know what I mean? It's just that commitment. I mean, there's a lot of um the North is an easy code to crack when you crack it, you know what I mean? But it can mm -hmm. it can get you. But um so day one, Zaldane, day two, Jason Christie cracking a tube like we're so expected to see him. Anything else yeah. stand out from his day? Um, I want to just take a step back to Zaldane. I remember one incident. He caught a small, small mouth. It was like a pound and a half, maybe, maybe two pounds. And he's reeling it up to the boat. He's just trying to get it in as quick as he can. And this freaking muskie comes out from under the boat and grabs his small mouth. Um, which I thought was pretty cool. And then, you know, he did a little playing around with it because it was such a, a neat experience. So we didn't get to air that on live, but that was that was pretty cool. And one of the things that that kind of revealed was on a lake like St. Clair, where there are so many muskies, there's, yeah. there's so many of them. Um, I mean, I think outside of maybe day, day four, I think someone caught one or at least raised one every day at the boat. I mean, it, 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 they're, they're everywhere. Right. I was shocked and, not to see as many of them on camp. Like, I mean, we've had years where I remember Todd Faircloth when he went out there, he said there was like five occurrences where one tried to grab his bay, his fish or did grab his fish on the final day. So yeah, no, they're they, like they are rampant. A dude, this true story, throw this in a dude just one year ago, triathlete, um, near Detroit, but on the Canadian side. So Windsor swims out there every day. And a dude got bit by a muskie while trim really? while swimming. Well, dude, you I mean, those things, dude. I've had a muskie hit my trolling motor up there. Like literally, they're they are aggressive Ferocious. up there. They're the apex predator. And um, there's so I mean, many I don't think Buddy was for food. Yeah, and I don't think he was trying to eat Buddy. I think he had a swimming, you know, probably a watch on or something like that that was flashing and um I mean, if they'll bite a trolling motor, why won't they bite, you know, a training watch or whatever? So um, <laughs> if you're a trainer out there, just just be careful because the muskie will get you. Yes. Yeah, so that was a cool experience with Zaldane. Um, I don't recall. I don't recall anything else really that stood out with Jason other than we ran to Canada once. He caught two little ones and was like, we're, we're out of here. Like we ran all the way up there and then he caught two fish that just didn't have the meat on them that the the ones at anchor bay did so we literally packed up and turned around and ran all the way back and that's when he showed up with about an hour and a half to go and he was searching 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 and then finally he got back to a spot he really wanted to be on and upgraded those three fish in the last hour which i thought was pretty impressive you know i've never asked you but just zeldane and christy i'm thinking while you're answering that you know like those are two guys you have great relationships with you've you know you've covered them multiple times knowing them for years what what is when do you first get in the boat what is the conversation like is it like here we go again or you know how how does it all go down i think it's more let's go you know like we've been we've done this before and we know what the experience before and during takeoff is going to be like and i'm i'm always amped like i'm always fist bumping and i'm like come on let's go man let's go you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm just jacked up. So I, I feel like perhaps that energy transcends into them and their energy transcends back to me. Um, but then once the trolling motor goes down, I'm pretty quiet on the back of the boat and I just let them do their thing and see how the day is going to unfold. And then, you know, my, my energy sort of, uh, really follows what happens during the day because when they're not doing well, they like to be quiet. Are you happy to get away from, well, maybe you might happen to Champlain, but flipping season and just having lighter 
baits flying at you in the back deck? Did you get hit by? <laughs> I mean, a three quarter ounce tube wouldn't be fun either. I imagine no, no, no wounds this week. No, no wounds. I got hit with a rod a couple of times because, you know, landing, the difference between landing a large mouth and a small mouth is two totally different games, right, without a net. And they're constantly lipping or boat flipping large mouth into the boat. But with these small hooks and the soft, you know, tissue in their mouth and the small mouth on these on these uh, small mouth, they have to they have to. Uh, bread loaf them to get them back in the boat yeah they don't they don't flip them i mean there's just too much too much to to lose there and so that's always a struggle and i'm tr still after so many years trying to figure out well what camera angle a can i get to that's going to differentiate you know how this land this landing uh, approach looks like but if I get too close, their rods are always flying because they're, you know, they're holding it like this and they're reaching down trying to get the fish um, and, and cut by the belly. And so I, it, there's a fine line there. One time Taku's line got hung around the microphone on on my camera and he literally just I, every, every time I tell all my anglers on smallmouth, I'm right behind you. So they know where I am. And when the line got caught, he just literally reached back there, unhooked it and landed the fish. So that's my nervousness about being a camera guy on these smallmouth lakes is God, I hope, you know, I don't, I don't cause them to lose, you know, a five or six pounder or something like that, or even, even a, even a, you know, a, uh, one of their five keepers. I, I just don't want to be a part of that because that's not my job. My job is to capture it and to tell the story with my camera. And I don't want to be that. I don't want to feel, I, I just don't want to feel that, you know? No, no, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be an uncomfortable moment. Have you, has anybody ever like broken off a fish because of your camera? Or, I mean, it, it happens, you know what I mean? Like you're, it, it, it's, but I got, you imagine how like uncomfortable the next, like, say it happens hour one so i'm out here for seven hours with this dude and, and i gotta uh, live with this i gotta <laughs> be with this person <laughs> yeah i'm i'm not i'm not going there <laughs> <laughs> oh people are gonna want you to just because you said you're not going there I but i won't push you um because one of the most fun person people that persons people to cover has to be takumi ito and um you were with him the final two days of the event and some incredible moments happened as always do. I mean, that dude, if he's on camera, win, lose or draw, you're going to leave the tournament with him being part of the highlight. And I don't mean you as in you, I mean, all of us uh, just watching it. So I can only imagine what it's like to actually be on the boat and experience it front row. I don't know how many times I've said this and messages and, and responses, comments and posts, about Taku this uh, past weekend, but I'll say it again on, on this show, it's like being in the boat with one of my kids. I mean, it's like, he's just so much fun. You can't help but love the guy because he's so positive. He's always, he's very focused. He uses all these crazy baits, you know, and he hides, he hides his baits really well. If you'll notice, he I'm going to, I hope he doesn't get mad at me for saying this, but when he lands his fish, he makes sure that his back is to me. And when he pulls his fish in, he keeps it in front of him. He unhooks his fish, makes sure his bait is hidden, throws the hook back in the water, then turns around and goes, ha, <laughs> five pound a giant. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, rightfully so most of his baits that he fishes with, particularly when he's on camera are prototypes and he doesn't want to reveal what he's showing. And the Japanese guys are so secretive anyway. And that's part, I think that's part of their whole honor system and, and their culture is to, once you're sworn to secrecy, you're sworn to secrecy. Plus he doesn't want other people to know what he's using because he's being successful. Right. Yeah. Are you going to tell us what he's using or no? No. <laughs> I'm half Japanese and I have you weren't honorable... sworn to secrecy though. I was. He he every every time I get in Taku's boat, I'm sworn to secrecy because he always says, no zoom in on bait. Okay. I go, okay, okay, no problem, Taku. We're good. So we're finding <laughs> the real side of Takumi. I mean, uh, <laughs> he giggles and talks about smallmouth Disneyland just to distract you from what's really going on. He um, knows what he's doing. 
what if you just tell him I, I made you? He'd probably laugh at me and karate kick me in the throat. <laughs> I don't know. I love Taku and I would never dishonor him. He is, he is, he is one of the most fun experiences to be in the boat with. He, I wish everyone could jump in his boat and go fishing with him because he's a blast. I mean, you're totally destroying this whole, like the ultimate <laughs> behind the scenes insider. <laughs> He'll tell you most of the truth. Unless Takumi Ito makes him not hey, tell you. He uses, let me say this. He uses baits unlike anything else that's out. Maybe Fujita is using something not, similar. None of this is helping people want to hear about it less. Let me finish. Let me finish. Okay, sorry, sorry. And his baits are always, they always have dangly things on them. <laughs> They're as small as your thumbnail. And he catches big fish on little bitty tiny baits and that may be why he said that that tube jig to zona the tube jig is too big he is he is a master at small baits and i'll, I'll say this it was a i don't even know what it was it was a tiny little creature on a hook and it's it's a it's a standard drop shot setup he does use he puts his hook really close to the bottom on his drop shots. He has a really small leader or the way he rigs his, his uh, baits. They're, they're basically right at the weight. Um, and I don't know if that's just because, you know, he wants the fish to stay on the bottom or he's trying to prevent the fish from, cause I, well, I did see several fish, particularly, and you know, now with front facing sonar, with Zaldane and Jason Christie and not one time with Taku where the, the fish came up and, and, and bit the weight and actually took the weight off the line with those drop shots. So I, I'm not sure why he ties it so close to the weight, but that's one of his uh, very traditional styles that he uses at least every time I've been in his boat. All right. So what stood out to you that you're willing to tell us? <laughs> Nothing. Now that's it. Thanks for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> See y'all later. Have a good have a good life. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> I think I think um Taku is so zoned in to smallmouth and he knows he actually knows where to go find them in the grass. I don't think he caught any of his fish in the sand. Every one of them were in the grass. And maybe that's why he uses those baits close to the weight because he's keeping his bait in the grass. And all those Japanese guys, you know, I'm convinced that the most important thing that they do is they wiggle their jiggle differently than everybody else. They have a very, they have a very, even when they're reeling it in, they're constantly moving their rod, unlike a lot of people where they're just reeling it in to get it back out there, right? And, and, and Taku is constantly doing that and he catches random fish doing that other times. I mean, it seemed like it's honestly, my days went by so fast with Taku because it seemed like he caught one every cast, you know, whether it was a, a wow. dink or a big one, it was unbelievable how many fish he caught. There's insane. I mean, it was, it was literally the law of averages when he got into smaller fish you you know what I realized about it was he's not on the right fish and he's getting ready to pack up and move because he just caught four and four casts that were two pounds and he knew at that point the wrong these are the wrong fish and we pack up and move 200 yards and then he would start catching three pounders and he would move somewhere what makes I mean I don't know enough about uh, smallmouth in depth to understand do they literally just school in age class Dude, I think St. Clair breaks the rules on all of those. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think I the agree. fish move so much. It's all just bait driven. Um, there's some people who believe it's age class. There's a lot of mysteries about smallmouth. I mean, a lot of people were debating this weekend about the color of the smallmouth. But the thing about the smallmouth is, dude, like, I don't hold a lot of weight in the color thing. You know what I mean? Where people are like, oh, a darker fish means that they're, yeah, I, I I've heard people that say either. that means that they're a resident fish. I've heard people say that means they just moved up shallow. Um, I've heard all sorts of different things. Um, a friend of mine texted me this week and told me it was because they're darker and it attracts more sun when they're shallow and it allows them to digest quicker. I don't know any of that, but what I will tell you is I've underwater footage of a smallmouth bass 
literally swimming across the bottom. It's a sand bottom and it's light and it goes over a finger of rocks and you can literally, as it sits there for a second, you can see it's, it's literally colors change. I mean, you can catch the darkest smallmouth bass wow. on earth, put it in your live well, take it out a couple minutes later. It's all barred up and you know, they are, they're aquatic chameleons. So a lot of those things where they say, you know, they're all in class, but, but I think I'll never argue with Takumi. Obviously Takumi's finding like if he's catching smaller ones, he's going to have to worm through them. And I also think if, when you explain his baits as little as maybe you did but <laughs> when we played our game of Pictionary here about his lures, he's got smaller baits, dude. If you're spending a ton of time around rats, you are going to spend your entire day reeling in rats. So I think he's got to move around to, to get on that bigger bite. I mean, clearly he knows what he's talking about when it comes to smallmouth. His track record is, is ridiculous um, for a guy who had never, Fish for smallmouth. Like the story of Takumi Ito is mind boggling. Like you look at Koya. Koya's won a bunch of tournaments in Japan. He's won Angler of the Year four times. Takumi never fished tournaments in Japan. Takumi, if you ask me, he was like, I was, um, what did he say? A movie star, um, which translates to he was an influencer, basically. He would go fish shorelines and like, here's how I'm using the bait. And you could see from his, how entertaining he is to cover that. That was very entertaining, but literally his dream to fish here came from a video game. And it's not like he, you know what I mean? So you look at how far and how fast he's come. It's, it's amazing. Back to the baits though. Let me ask you this. Are any of the baits that you've saw Takumi Ito throw, are any of them similar to the ones that we've seen from Koya? I don't know because I haven't been in Koya's boat. You'll not and, answer anything this no, week. No, no, no. Uh, let me guy. say this. Let me say this. So the very first, uh, when, when Taku became a, a household name, we all, I think you and I know, or and a lot of people do, some people don't, it all started on St. Clair. Yeah. And you're fishing that and little crab bait, right? Exactly. And so, and his bait this time was very similar to that crab. They're tiny. They look like little rubber things that you put on the end of pencils. You know, little kid toys remember, yeah. that you, that's what they look like. And, and he's literally, there's nothing sophisticated about it. It's a, it's a standard drop shot. He's using, he changes hooks a lot. He, he change, he makes sure his hooks are very sharp and he change. I would say, I don't even know how often he changed hooks, but you know, he had, he had a whole line of hooks on his, on his trash can door right there, but you know, on his step up, he had, he probably had 50 little hooks lined up knowing he was going to go through all those hooks, changing hooks often. So, you know, he likes a sharp hook and but all of his bait. Does he stop to sharpen them ever? Or is literally never. he just, if he, he cuts he it off, doesn't sharpen, he cuts, cuts it off, off and reties everything, everything. Wow. Wow. And okay. yeah, and 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 he keeps all of his baits in his locker, in his middle locker, and in his skeeter, and they're they're in a Tupperware container. His organizational uh, program or system in his locker with all of his baits are it's all Tupperware. There's no like bait boxes. It's all these plastic tup little Tupperware boxes stacked up in big Tupperware boxes. And, and he's, again, you know, unless like, you don't even see his baits on the floor in the boat, but because he's so secretive with them, when he takes them off, if, if there's a blown, uh, if there's a leg pulled off or a, a tentacle pulled off or half the baits there, or if it's ripped through the hook or whatever it is, he takes that bait and puts it up in front with him. So I can't see it. <laughs> He's very secretive with his baits. Every now and then I'll catch one on the floor and I lifted one up. I said, I said, this is pretty cool. And he grabbed it from me and put it over there by a steering wheel. The dark side of <laughs> Takumi. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, Hey, if you're a magician, you don't want to tell people what your tricks are. Right. I just think it's amazing that, you know, that's just really starting to become a thing now. Like, you know, Koya has never really been, I mean, he's only been here for a year, but he's never really showing. But Takumi's good. Like, everybody's like, oh, I love Takumi. He's like, if he, if Jason Christie hides his baits, people are like, well, what is wrong with this guy hiding his baits? But Takumi has found a way to fool us all with 
Small Malt Disneyland, Mark Zona Bass, Davy Height Bass, Mercer Bass, all these ridiculous things. And nobody has realized up till now he's hiding his baits as much as he is. See, I think it's I, I honestly believe this because all the Japanese guys are the same way, except yeah. maybe Tak Amori. I mean, he's, you know, he comes from a different time. Oh, no, period. no, 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 no. He, he was very secretive, dude. He was okay. very, okay. very okay. secretive. Well, then, okay. Even with that classic one and everything, dude, like there's a lot. He didn't want people to see a lot of the stuff that he threw, too, which. I kind of don't blame them, but I also get like, it's, it's kind of the weird thing about the world right now. Like fishing, all of us have secrets in fishing, whether it be a spot, a way to work a bait, something you do to a bait that that's what fishing is. Um, but Bass Live is everything that is not that. I mean, it exposes <laughs> everything. So it does. And, 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 but let me get back to, I think yeah, yeah. it's, it's part of the Japanese culture and I've never fished in Japan. I'm going to, there's no question. Like I'm going to go to Japan and I'm going to go bass fishing with someone because of what's happening and how many Japanese guys are coming over here to try to get into the elite uh, level of professional bass fishing. But I think maybe it's because it's so combat fishing in Japan and it's so crowded and there's so much pressure that when they find something that works, they don't want everyone to know because as soon as they do, it becomes the hottest thing in the retail market in Japan. Every bank fisherman there goes and buys it. And then all of a sudden they got to come up with something different because the fish figure it out. And I think that just transcends into their mentality and their mindset when they come over here. And I realize a lot of people don't want to reveal their baits, but a lot of these guys who are sponsored by bait lure companies or brands, they, they want to, because they want, because that's part of their job is to expose a new prototype that's coming out. Like, you know, when the big, when the big uh, mag drafts came out and the, you know, the big giant swim bait, uh, trend started you know it was all about promoting that and then all the other companies copied it and you know it, it goes that direction i think the japanese people are more cognizant of not trying to sell baits and just trying to focus on catching bass yeah and i think there's an element to it i, I don't know that i mean i'm i'm sure jason christie would rather people not see things and i think there's also a part of it that it's in your head too. Like knowing, like I remember years ago, there was a pro that when we were doing bass cams, we pulled up on him and I shot a bass cam of him catching several fish it was day one of the tournament. And I mean, it was great stuff and I'm ready to post these. He's like, can you, can you not post that? And I'm like, well, why is it the area? And he's like, because I mean, it was a shoreline of buck brush and we were on a lake that was just surrounded, but I mean, it was very, you couldn't tell where he was. And he's like, I just don't want people to see what I'm doing, like what I'm throwing. And he was throwing a white swim jig, which 70% of the field at the end of that were throwing a white swim. But I still feel like they don't know that. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like when you sit on a point, like when you cover an event on a point, if they come around the corner and they see nobody there. They think there's been no one there for hours. And I got this spot to myself. They don't realize mm -hmm. that somebody literally they're wake just settled as they left so i think just even feeling like you have something that nobody else has probably makes you more competitive yeah i think i think that's very true in their confidence level i mean you hear it all the time it's all about confidence whatever you have confidence in and i remember you know one of the things that will forever stand out in my mind on saint Clair, while everyone else is out there doing similar things drop shots you know, Ned rigs or wacky worms or whatever they're throwing, the traditional smallmouth baits. Jay Yellis was in that bay throwing uh, chatter baits and catching them. He had a top five finish. I covered him on day in three and four the last time we were at St. Clair. No, day four the last time we were at St. Clair. And it was remarkable and so much fun to see him doing something so different. And I was actually anticipating someone – catching on to that from the last time we were there and seeing if that bite was going to go again. But I don't think anyone tried that. Do you? Um, no, I don't, I don't know anyone. I can, I mean, 70% of the field fished one circle in anchor yeah, bank, anchor which bay, is, yeah. I mean, dude, I haven't remembered a tournament like that since 
Palatka when every when Lake George had all the eelgrass and seventy five of a hundred would go down there and and bed fish that area. But I mean that's that's rare. So I mean that was right, that one, one spot on Harris Chain. I think last year uh, where everyone was fishing that grass down at Harris Chain, there was a yeah. lot of boats in there on day one and day two there too. But yeah, that was a very large community hole. <laughs> I think well, Bill I, Lowen threw a swim jig in a, I mean, he caught good weight and he threw a swim jig in a top water and you know, that'd be about the closest I saw to I that. Think but he I mean, said he caught, he caught a good too. one on a, on a six inch swim jig. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. But, but, um, what was I going to say? H how many fish, how many fish are there to produce that many catches of that quality? How many fish are, and in that lake, first of all, and how many fish are in are in Anchor Bay? I mean, that is just like mind boggling to think about how many fish were being caught out there constantly. Z and I talked about that a lot on on our live segments, which was a lot of fun working with Zona this weekend. I mean, we work together all the time, on but side, just standing yeah. side by side, kind of like yeah. the old days. I'm like, all that's missing is Tommy. He was at Steel Timber Sports mm -hmm. this weekend, but. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about it a lot and, um, you know, Zona knows more about St. Clair than I ever will. And, and his thought on it. And I have to agree since what we, everybody thinks of schools as fish of eight to 20. I mean, the schools, there are hundreds, like 500, 700 fish. I mean, and dude, they're just, they're just eating and they'll be there as we saw. I mean, you also would see quite often, in a tournament where that many boats were fishing one area by the end, it would be done. I, we shot a commercial <laughs> the next morning for AFCO and guys were spending literally 10 minutes in the boat with our camera person and swindle caught a four pounder. He went right out there and just two casts. Of cut. Like, so there's still fish there. They're still catching them. Um, I just think that those schools are, I mean, it, it's kind of like I use the example of here. I live on the water here and it, and just for some reason, every once in a while, there'll be a massive amount of swallows feeding and, and we don't have hundreds of swallows in front of our house at any other time, but all of a sudden they all get the memo somehow in nature that this is where you need to go. And this is the fish and it's they're dive bombing everywhere. I think that's exactly what's happening under these boats. I think that you, you just have a pack of fish, more fish move in and they, they are just there for one reason. And yeah, that's, to, yeah. And, and the, here's another cool thing that was happening at that event. Shout out to the bass fishing hall of fame, because what they did is they funded a thing with bass and the bass fishing hall of fame with the Michigan DNR. Um, no DNR's Randy Van Dam store, but the, the Michigan I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know the Their ex department of natural resources. Exactly. Whatever that is. Yes. Exactly. Um, where they actually put transmitters on 15 fish that were caught in this tournament. So very, very expensive technology, but most of the information we get about smallmouth are from, you know, that little lip tag and somebody has to catch it for you to be like, okay, well, it was caught in anchor Bay. And now somebody caught it at the Thames river on the Canadian shore or bell river hump or, or on Lake Erie. But this is actual trackers that are all throughout the Great Lakes. So they they took some fish that were caught up in Huron. They took some fish that were caught in the Canadian side. They took some fish that were caught in Anchor Bay. We took some fish from Erie. So they took some fish from all these and they put transmitters and we're going to find out where these smallmouth go and, and how they disperse out after a tournament. So kudos to the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame, not just honoring our history, but making us better anglers and, and allowing us to get that information. So some really cool, cool stuff. But I think those schools to answer that question with a very long answer, hundreds, if not thousands at times. Now, and there, there has to be just thousands of them, man. I mean, what, what, what is going on out there? I mean, there was another 50 boat tournament on top of ours on day three, where on Saturday, where, you know, you added another 50 boats from some other tournament, local tournament that was going on. And, and then there's local fishermen, there's outfitters out there and, and, you know, large vessels <laughs> 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 drifting right. and, and stuff like that. And it's more than just, you know, 50 Bassmaster elite anglers, they're sharing a hole. This was literally a, it looked like a Walmart parking lot, you know, on, on, 
the blue light special day. I mean, it was, it was, it was crazy. And the, uh, you know, I was talking to Gene Gilliland after at the day three weigh-ins about what they were doing. I love talking to Gene. I learn, I learn a lot just from talking to him and, you know, his experience with uh, fisheries biology and all the things that they've done with, uh, you know, with the recovery program and the catch and release program with Bassmaster. And he was telling me about how, you know, they don't, because I asked him, I said, so are you guys going to, y'all should create an app where people can get the app and follow the smallmouth. You should name them like, name, like what Taku was doing, name one Zona, name one Merch, one of the, and this is a tangent, one of the funniest things that whole tournament. Finish your thoughts, you finish, your, <laughs> finish your thoughts on, on okay, Gene okay. first. <laughs> okay. And, and, and the, 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 interesting thing about what uh, gene was telling me was how they can't they can't track the fish as they're as they're migrating they have poles yeah which are record uh receiving devices underwater so they have to go out and collect the data from those different uh monitors each time to gain that knowledge which which i thought was interesting and I said, why don't you, you know, wh how can they do that on sharks? And he said, because they put $50,000 transmitters on dorsal fins of great white sharks and giant hammerheads and they surface, they come to the surface often so they can track them uh, like that. So it's interesting what they were doing, how they were doing it and all the information. And I went to eat dinner with Zona, me and Wes and Brian Evie, Zona and Karen Zona went to eat dinner uh, one night. I think it was uh, after the first night, uh, first day, and we went to a steakhouse and, and he was showing me where he had caught two 12, 12 inch smallmouth that had migrated, like where they tagged those fish and where he caught those fish and returned that data, how far those smallmouth had actually migrated from one point to the next. I mean, it was, it was miles and miles that they, that they had migrated. But the most interesting thing was, was that these were obviously very young age class bass that they had tagged. And, you know, the questions are, well, you know, what what instinctively made them migrate from where they tagged them all the way down to where they were caught like which, which you would never even think a fish a freshwater fish would travel that far much less need to travel that far to take advantage of whatever resources or or whatever goes on biologically in those fish to make that happen it's phenomenal yeah and, and it's gonna what this is so basically what i've been told is so the pinging is whenever they get within two miles of one of these transmitters which they've got distributed Receiver. all throughout the great lakes they'll know which and people are like well what, what how is that going to help things well i told the story on live and for those of you who didn't hear it there was a fish that was tagged on lake erie so the buffalo end of lake erie on the canadian side in a tournament and was released just a just a lip tag you know tag. no transmitter or anything a year later that fish was caught on lake ontario in the mouth of the niagara river there is two wow. ways basically to do that um you either one go through the welland canal which i believe is 20 to 40 miles long of concrete like it's literally like a ship highway nothing there's the Panama I mean, Canal. <laughs> yeah, but it's not sure it's not natural shorelines. It's like it's like a break wall the whole way up through right. all of this. So fairly unlikely that it went that way. But is it more unlikely that it went over the falls? Because those are the two ways to go. But with this technology, you would know because you would have seen like it was working its way down the Niagara River, or here it is, you know, going through the well, in canals, so it, it's going to answer a lot of questions, and and I I'm like you, I love all that stuff. That, I mean, I, I do too. I'm a geek when it comes to all that, man. I could just sit there and listen to that, listen to Gene Gilliland all day long, talk about you know the information that that he's learned over the years, and then think because things start to make more sense after that, or maybe some things make less sense after that. I I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you it, the more information you have, the more you can figure out. So kudos to bass michigan and 
of course, the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame, who uh, who took some of their fine funds and put it towards that. So cool stuff that we're learning because of that. Mm -hmm. So let's get back to the funniest thing that I remember about the whole tournament was when Taku, you were interviewing Taku at the dock before day four takeoff. But and before we get into this, tell me what happened on day okay. three. He's called called fish zone a bass, right? Because they were big. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, he called. He was calling. Uh, he land. He was landing one, and he called. This is a zona bass because he was talking about how big it was, and because every time he hooks up, the fish is always out in front because he's pitching or casting out in front of the boat. And when he when he hooks up, I'm all, my first my first question to him is he goes, "Is it a big one?" And he, he's either he answers, you know, no, 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 it's small, it's small. Or he goes, oh, yeah, I think so. I think it's giant. And so this time, instead of saying giant so often, he started naming his fish and he started out with Zona, which I thought was pretty cute. And he was off camera when we moved to the next spot after that started. He looked at me and he said, do you think uh, Zona uh, mad? And I said, no, dude, <laughs> trust me. Zona loves you. Everybody loves you. They're going to take that exactly what you meant it to be. And it, I think everyone's going to laugh and think that's funny, including Zona. <laughs> what was Zona's response on live? I didn't hear it. Uh, I asked him and he he said he wasn't happy, but I feel like he was just selling to Kumi's <laughs> bet. I mean, um, it, it, uh, it, I did think it was funny that by the time we got to take off on day four, he went out of his way to be like, you know, Zona, very muscular, large, yeah, tall. Yeah. Like he was Big, very, just, yeah. <laughs> so tell me about your funny moment. And I, I will tell you my behind the scenes of said funny moment after you tell the story. So when you're interviewing him and he's talking about the Zona fish and then he starts going through people and then he's, he hesitates. He's like, maybe today I will catch a. Uh, um, uh, maybe Mercer fish, and you went, <laughs> Oh, yeah, if you catch a Mercer fish, you're gonna win. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's the behind the scenes of that that I love. Um, listen, I throw softballs at these guys all the time, you some did, of them are them incredible for hitting it every time, and Takumi is one of them. He literally has never missed a softball I threw at him, so that <laughs> happened at takeoff, and and I, I knew that would get a laugh, right? I mean, you just assume. Um, and it's not like this was planned out the night before. Like, this is literally a plan that formulates in my head while he's answering the question before. Um, so I intentionally said yesterday on live, you called your big bass a Zona bass. Was that a compliment or an insult? And that's when he went out of his way to say how masculine and strong and big zona yeah. is and his bass was like that and i was literally waiting to say so what kind of bass do you need to catch today but i didn't even have to ask him that question because he took that first answer and then went into today and between me and him there was this moment where if it, it, I, it was one of my favorite parts to me he starts he's like today i need uh and then he goes, looks at me. For those of you listening to the audio version, he's just kind of looking up and down with his eyes, but like gently. Exactly. Because you could tell, like, I, I think, again, he thought, is Mercer going to be insulted by this or something? But I gave him like the yes. And he's like, Mercer Bass and sold it. Exactly. I mean, um, it got a huge laugh. Uh, so good. And um, and then just when I thought the gift couldn't give any more. Somebody sent me the video of when he caught what he thought was a Mercer bass. Mm -hmm. And it is, you know, go find it on Bassmaster social media. Um, it was, I mean, Mercer's my friend, it, my best buddy. Like it just, <laughs> I mean, it becomes a whole thing that only Takumi Ito can do. And it turns out all that he's doing is trying to distract us all. So we're not looking at his face. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny, man. Did he uh, not steal the show at weigh in on uh, day four? All dude oh always like so he is dude, they, everything he has every reason to fail at that you know what i mean he has a exactly. obvious language barrier um he knew he wasn't gonna win the tournament yeah like, like everything was it goes against him and he literally stole the show and he had the crowd in stitches including myself i mean that was freaking that that is entertainment at its best, man. 
every time he gets a chance to every single, and I tell pros this, whether they're rookies or whatever, I'm like, anytime you have a shot, anytime you have a shot on camera, make it memorable. And, oh, well, who we got a visitor here. What? Who's this? This is my baby girl, Scarlett. Hey, Can Scarlett. Say hi. Mwah. I love you. Are you okay? Yeah. Is we're almost good? done. We're almost done with the podcast. Can I come upstairs in a few minutes? What you need, baby? Tell me. You want to eat your Smarties? You can have those. No problem. Yeah, just eat okay. junk food. <laughs> <laughs> okay, come on. Scarlett just made this show. Back, a lot I'll prettier. be up there in about. Never heard I'll be up compliments. there in just a few minutes. Okay. What, baby? Uh, maybe five or ten more minutes. Okay. Okay, go eat them. I've never felt more pressure to finish a podcast faster in my life. We got five minutes, bro. (laughs) Just in case you're ever wondering if this is real, this podcast, we just proved it by a visitor. So we'll finish up quickly here. But yeah, Takumi, every time he gets a shot, dude, he hits a home run. Like literally name a time that he's been on camera, win, lose, or draw that you don't leave there feeling like, wow. Um, I want to take this guy home with me. Yeah. Like, he's like a freaking, he's like a stuffed animal toy. I mean, he's just, <laughs> he's just, he's, he is delightful to be around. He's like that in real life. You know, he's, he and I have had lots of different, we've talked on the phone privately before between tournaments, just to catch up and say hi. He is always like that. And he's so polite and he's so, he's so, um, He's so honorable and he's so funny. He cut. I I I don't think there's any way that he re- rehearses this stuff. This stuff is totally spontaneous and serendipitous, and he just freaking nails it because that's his personality and character. Yeah, yeah, he definitely nails it. Um, a great angler, a great tournament, and Joey Fuentes. What a great season, rookie season. Two wins. He's leading rookie of the year, Dakota Lithium rookie of the year, and in contention to win the Progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year title. Not a bad year for the Cowboy. What what a run he's having. I mean, and I have not been in his in Joey's boat, so I don't know him very well. In fact, I really don't even know him. I did congratulate him um, after his win and you know, we exchanged handshakes and I would love to get to know him better because he's obviously very good at what he does. <laughs> um, do you want to sit up here with me? Come on, she's welcome. Come here. This this is just you Give just be part of the show. <laughs> yeah. Can, can you say hi? Wait, can you say hi? Wave, say hi. No, okay. No. Then come here and cuddle no. up next to me. So uh-huh. this is what it's like to have Takumi Ito in your boat. <laughs> <laughs> I tell everyone he's like having your kid like fish going fishing with your kid. And I think the most important thing about Taku and what he does is that he's having so much fun out there because this is a dream come true for him. And he doesn't want this to ever go away. I truly believe that. Yeah. Does he keep that level of excitement up all day? The same thing we see on camera. Like that's him always right. When he, Hey, when he, when he pulls up to a spot and he uh, he turns his engine off. He every single time he goes, okay, let's go, let's go, let's go. Like that's this is before he goes up and drops his trolling motor. He's got that energy, and I, you know, I've been with him before when he wasn't doing so well, and he does get down on himself at times, you know, and and but you know somehow he just brings himself back up, and we knew that he was going to be in tension when we got to the smallmouth swing that he was going to be in contention and we knew he did well on St. Clair the last time he was here. And he basically did the same thing and, and had a very, very good tournament. He could have easily, he was one bite. What he, 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 what was the difference between him and, and Joey? I know Luke was in the middle there. You know, we haven't yeah, I mean, talked was, about Luke Palmer yet, dude. Yeah. I mean, another shot to title, you know, and so weird, dude. How is it so weird that when you win one, like it happened to Bill Lowen too. Like Luke Palmer was the most, one of the most consistent pros we had on tour. hundred percent. Just couldn't just never got over that hump for a win. Well, he wins one. And since then he's been kind of, you know, had his roughest patch. Well, another shot at them this week. And uh, Luke 
Palmer is an incredible angler and just stud. And when I kept bringing up how Gussie told him how to tie braid and floral together just a few years ago, that wasn't a slight. That was my amazement to be like, dude, you got to, you're leading this event. You got a deck full of spinning rods. What an incredible climb that guy continues to have. And he's going to be part of the sport for a long, long time. I mean, he's a, he's a giant largemouth power fisherman yeah. to a T and he adjusts and dang near wins St. Clair on spinning rods and tiny baits. It's wild. He, he's wild. An, me and I went to dinner, uh, after the, after day three, I went to dinner with Lee Livesey and that crew, um, Logan and Caleb and Jesse and Drew Benton and Drew Cook were both there too. We all sat and had some beers and ate, ate protein and lee and i were talking about you know how impressive luke palmer is and always has been and without having talked about him this entire basically this whole podcast until now kudos to luke palmer for doing what he did and i mean actually going into day four i was kind of thinking man i I could easily see luke palmer winning this tournament well he almost did he almost did um but clearly it was meant to be for the cowboy. I mean, he had a fish jump in the boat. Um, just some that was, awesome that was stuff. Cool. We, I had a story that you really wanted me to tell on this podcast, but there is no way in hell I can tell it while your daughter is sitting on your lap. So it'll have to wait for another week um, <laughs> or another time. Well, she but, can't hear. I've got the headset. Well, on. I know, but just the, the optics of it. I can't okay, tell it okay, with her okay. little eyes just looking up at me. It just it won't <laughs> work good. So... I want to show you something before you leave, because this is okay. something I am incredibly proud of. I just got it home. I've had said thing for a year, but when I got it, I was flying and it, and I couldn't bring it with me. So uh, the Van Dams were both there and they took this for me home. And, and we said, hey, next time we're together, or, you know, we'll see you and I'll, I'll get it from you at an event that I'm driving from. Sherry Van Dam's amazing. Just to let you know, in case you're wondering, like the woman is amazing because to me, I would have never thought about this, but I'm driving to the event at St. Clair. And she's like, some of our friends, family from DNR are going to be at the weigh-in. Why don't I send this with you them so you can get it and you can drive it home because it doesn't fit Mm -hmm. in overhead. But this is one of the coolest things ever, dude. And I'm just going to open it now for the first time on the podcast. But if you're reading that, you're reading it right. That is one of Ray Scott's hats and um, something I am incredibly proud to own. I should remember that I wow. close to the uh, microphone because um, this is an audio podcast as well. But one of wow. the man's hats right there. And uh, that's the real find a spot deal. to hang it back here and always have it. But uh, a wow. treasured, treasured thing the chicken way to go sherry ray scott well she didn't give it to me she just sent it to me okay oh oh, okay i got you got you got you okay got you got you got you (laughs) no thank you sherry you are awesome do do remember to send it so yeah ray scott's hat will be uh, somewhere some part of our set and it's a pretty good segue because next we have another guy that wears a cowboy hat that is the og cowboy hat where but the one that is most recent is joey sefuentes and uh, we're going to speak with him a little bit and uh what 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 does your beautiful daughter want? Food? Hey, can you tell everybody? Can you say? Can you tell everyone? Hi. Tell what do you want? You want you want to go get a snack upstairs? You want to go? You want to go outside and play? You want to go ride bikes or what do you want to do? You don't know yet. She wants you okay, to hang we'll up on this silly podcast. Yeah, she just and, wants me to be dad. Well, you're very good at that, and she's. Yeah. Very cute little girl, and we thank her for. Oh boy, looks like she's got a hair or something in her mouth. All that. No, you she's got smarties. She's smarties. Oh, hey, can yeah. I show you one thing that was? Yeah. Just, when I got home from St. Clair, um, this was waiting on my front doorstep, and it was in a box. And I don't know how to say his last name, but Joey from Jolips Lures in oh, Australia. Oh yeah, yeah, the Australian dude. Never yeah. sent me crap. Well, I met him. <laughs> I met him at the classic at the dog. So did I. Evidently okay. not as well as you. Okay. Well, I guess you got to have, uh, I don't know what it was, but he <laughs> sent me a little box with some of his, uh, his crank baits and jerk baits in it. And he sent one and he painted this one, especially for 
Walker, my son, Joel Up Lures, and it uh, he asked me what my son's favorite color is on jerk baits, and I told him it's that table rock pattern, the V110 table rock pattern. So he he customized the paint job on this one, and I don't think there's any other one like it uh, in the world. And so thank you so much, Joey, for sending this, and I can't wait to see my son Walker catch a bass on this on this jerk bait. Thank you. That's a cute story and all, but all that stands out to me is, so you won't give us the juice on Takumi's baits, but you'll gladly turn this little <laughs> show into hey. your own little sales pitch for Jello Bluers. <laughs> Thank you, Joey. <laughs> Whatever. No, that's very cool. And just another example of how awesome the bass fans are that travel all around the world. I mean, so thankful for all of them. Uh, we Great crowds this week, giant crowds and an incredible response. And, um, and kids, kids are selfish. They need fed and stuff. So you better go feed that one. One last thing I did, you know, at the weigh-ins, I had so many people again on each afternoon come up to me and tell me how much they enjoy this podcast. So two things, Dave, thank you for allowing me to be a a part of this. I really, I love, I, I can't wait to get back and do these shows with you after each event. And thank you to all the viewers and fans out there that recognize, you know, what we do and, and, and what Dave does. And I know you're, you know, I don't know how many followers you have now, what, two or 3 million, (laughs) <laughs> at this point. but it's still growing and thank you guys for for watching this show it's pretty cool it's very very cool it's uh it's a gift for us and i love uh i i love what this show's given back because dude i just love having these conversations you know what i mean i love kind of reliving the event there's times where i'll leave and it's so much comes at you so quick you're just you you don't remember it all but i i, I think it's a lot of fun doing these so thank you for being the Jake that is Jake's take. And um, next up, can we can we get her to introduce the cowboy Joey Sofuentes? Do hey, you think she, you, but she's got to yell it. I mean, we got to hear I got, it. I want you to yell really loud. Four boxes of Smarties. Uh, for four boxes of Smarties for we'll it. Give you four, we'll give you four rolls of Smarties if you say, and now let's take it over to Joey Sofuentes. Can you say that? Come on, let's say, let's say, go Cowboys. Say, go Cowboy. What? Come on. Can you say, I'll give you another roll of Smarties. Say, go cowboy. Say, go cowboy. Say it. No, say, go cowboy. Not even she'll cheer for the cowboys. Okay. All right. That's as much as we're going to get. Say, bye. We try. Bye-bye. Can you you wave bye? Say, bye, Dave. (laughs) She's playing hard to talk. Thank you. And next up. The cowboy Joey Sifuentes, two-time Bassmaster Elite Series champion Joey Sifuentes. How good does that sound, dude? Sounds really good, Dave. Um, you know, I, I I've been telling folks that I really thought my my first one would be a smallmouth tournament, and I got that largemouth. Now I got the smallmouth. It's it's unbelievable, man. What was what was your goal? Like, be honest. I mean. Join the Elite Series. I mean, you had to set up a, a, this is what would make me happy. Obviously, I would assume you've overachieved, you know, of the initial goal because you'd drive yourself insane if your goal was like, I want to win two in my rookie season. But what was your original goal going into this, your first Elite Series season? Um, realistically, my my goal was to to make the classic. That was it. I just wanted to, I wanted to be competitive with all these guys. Um and and make the Bassmaster Classic. I've I've been to a few of those and worked them, and it's the greatest tournament there is in the world. And I just I wanted to be successful and make that thing. Like that's that's what I wanted to do. So clearly things things are going a little better or a little ahead of a schedule. Yeah, yeah, definitely a little ahead of schedule. Um, you know, I, I did I felt like I was getting close in my career where I was gonna get a win. So I did have that as one of my goals. Um uh, so, but yeah, no, it's way ahead now <laughs> when you get to, so pretty cool. Your family, unfortunately, wasn't able to be at this one. They were at the last yeah. one. What what was the homecoming like? Like that moment, jingling the keys and walking in the door. Yeah, it was, uh, it was awesome, man. Um, my daughter's just running up to me and, and giving me a hug and, uh, 
all my family being there and, and cheering for me. I mean, it was, uh, it's special. That's what it's all about. You know, I, I do this for, you know, for my family. I mean, I, I do it to provide for my family. It's my job. So, um, to, to be successful and, and to go get, get it done and, and bring home that money. It's, it's, it's awesome. It was incredible to watch, but I would say it was a, it was a special St. Clair tournament in the way that not just the weights and all the 20 pound bags, but dude, I would have lost my house. If somebody beforehand said that there will be two boats that run to Erie on day one, there will be 70 boats at some point during this tournament fishing anchor Bay and very few anglers fish. Like, I mean, how did you avoid that temptation? You know, do, so many anglers were fishing anchor bay and you were one of the few guys who literally said i'm going to go off out by myself in an area that isn't often by yourself um and and obviously it was the right call but how did you avoid the temptation to go where so many were going um so it was really hard because after for, after the first two days of the turn of practice um i didn't really find what i wanted to find in canada uh, on the canadian side on st Clair, and that's where i was my goal was to fish like 100 percent. so i was looking after day two of practice i was telling larry uh my travel partner i was like man i don't i don't really know what i'm gonna do should i we started talking about erie I was very curious about Huron, like if can you catch some fish down on the southern end of that? I fished in the the Saint, the river that flows into the St. Clair, the St. Clair River. Um, but I just I said, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna stick hard in Canada over there. I'm gonna keep looking and hopefully I find something. If not, I did find some of those same fish that the guys did in Anchor Bay. But I, I'm and and luckily that, you know. The last half of the day of practice, um, on day, on the third day of practice, I found I found some fish there. So I was just like, I'm all in on that. <laughs> How good was what you found on on the, that last day? Um, you know, the quality was good, but the the numbers of fish was not. It it yeah. it, it, it I really didn't know if it was going to be a winning thing. I, I thought that. But but the quality of fish was I went through there, I caught two four pounders and I jumped off a of five in a really small little area. And that was it. I never fished it anymore. I didn't look expand on it at all. Um, so I, I just didn't know, Dave, but it was the best I had found outside of Anchor Bay, somewhere that I knew was going to be safe from the boat traffic on the weekends. And, and I thought it was going to be a quality spot. So clearly your toughest day in the tournament had to be, you know, physically had to be that day three, you know, that rough day that, yeah. that everybody talked about how rough it was, but it was rougher where you were than maybe where anybody was. <sighs> Did you ever think of abandoning that plan at that point? Um, it, it, it was a really, it was really a struggle, like first thing in the morning and, and not exactly first when I got there, but maybe like an hour into it, the wind started really blowing. And I realized how much my my trolling motors come out of the water, um, how difficult it was to try and see fish. I just I kind of lost like some confidence there. Like I was thinking it was running through my head. Hey, I may have to leave here and go to anchor and like try and salvage the day because this is not going to work. But I I stuck with it and um, I ended up doing pretty well there, you know, catching catching 21 or something pounds out of there. So you literally had a fish jump in your boat. I mean, I swear to you, <laughs> me and and Zona were hosting live when that happened. And it jumps right beside the boat before that. And I literally, what was coming out of my mouth was, it's going to jump in the boat. And a second later, when it jumped in the boat, I regretted not saying what I was about to say, because I would have looked like <laughs> I knew what I was talking about. But, dude, you literally had fish. I mean, what goes, I mean, you were befuddled, as I would use as a word, because, I mean, you were like, yelling at Shane Durance, I think saying, or was it Shane Durance that was out shooting you? Yeah. 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 He was out there. Yeah, shooting. Did you get that? Did you like make it sure? Because it was that rare, but like when you step back up to go fish, like what is going through your head at that point that, that the fish actually jumped in your boat? So that was, I think that was like the third fish that was close to five pounds. And I ended up weighing yeah. it and it was like four and three quarters, but like it was dang near a five pounder. Um, I was like, man, this day is, is it's, it's going to be great. You know, I mean, um, but really, honestly, the, the thing that went through my head right then was, um, 
just the fact that like, you know, man, I've got, if, if, if it, if today's going to go like this, I've got a chance, like I, I can win this tournament, like without a doubt. So um, it felt really good day. Um, I've never had anything happen to me like that before. Uh, yeah. Shane was there actually say go. He, he re- literally just drove in, um, got that, got that uh, pictures and stuff of that too. So it was just, it was sweet, man. I mean, I'll never forget that moment the rest of my life. It definitely was one of those things that, and it, you know, you've heard this in every tournament, you know, Hey, when things like that start to happen, you got to start to think it's your tournament. And it's weird how in our sport, that is a thing. Like when you see those oddities of just, you know, people that catch fish that should, I remember Lee Livesey, some of the fish that would get wrapped up at Lake Fork and you're just like, there's no way this fish gets out. And at some points during the fight, it looked like he gave up but the fish stayed on like when weird things like that start to happen. Have you always kind of been a believer of that? And and did that make you a believer at that moment? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I think there's, there's times where you can't do nothing wrong, man. It's, it's going to happen. It's meant to be. Um, so, so yeah, those, those, those are the, those are the things that get you the win. Um, you know, I, I didn't, I don't know if I had like one of those moments at Seminole when I won this year, but cause it was just every day was, was great. <laughs> it was way more of a grindy tournament, you know, like a lot more pressure cause you got the lead, but, but yeah, those, 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 those moments are, um, they, I believe they'll happen. That's what gets you those, gets you the wins. Is there any similarities between those two wins? Like when you look at them, is there any similarities in your mind? Um, no, they, they're really different. Like, like really are because I'm sitting as, as a, you know, I'm in the lead. I've got a four pound lead, I think going in the last day and I was leading for three days. Um, this tournament was completely different. The pressure at Seminole was so high. I mean, and plus it was my first like opportunity to get my first yeah. win. So, um, this, this tournament was stress, really stress-free. Um, you know, there's, there's always some stress when you're trying to land five pounders and put them in the boat, but, uh, but no, it was completely different. It, nothing about it seemed to be the same. It was, um, it, it's you know, being in second place, you're not, you don't have that pressure of of holding the lead and and trying to win. So uh, just completely different. Which do you like better? I mean, the end result is the ultimate thing. But which do you do you like to be chasing, or do you, or would you rather be comfortable in the lead? Uh, I would, I would say the Saint Clair uh, chasing because um, you just, you know. Like I said, the pressure, you don't have the pressure and um, you, you don't have as many things running through your head. And uh, it's it's just a lot more, you know, you're a lot more calm. I mean, you know, I, I would love to be chasing and not <laughs> have people behind your back, man. Like because these man, these guys are so good. So good. They're good. But, dude, you're right up there with some of the best this year. Like you're leading Dakota Lithium Rookie of the Year you have an opportunity, you know, points wise, you're very much in the progressive Bassmaster angler of the year race. Dude, the last 12, like if you look where you were 12 months ago, that is not a slight at all. It's just like you said, the entire, I don't think it was just you. I think when you came to the elite series, everybody kind of pinpointed you as well. He's a rookie, but man, he is one of those guys who is ready to make that next step. But like, You're a two-time Elite Series champion. You're leading Rookie of the Year, and you're two events away from potentially being Rookie of the Year and Angler of the Year. When you got up this morning and you were brushing your teeth, was there any part of you that was like, what is happening? Yeah, yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Um, Didn't didn't dream my my first year would go like this. Um, But, no, I – listen, Dave, I'm going to – I've been telling folks this. And I may have told you on stage, but my goal, I, I, these were the three tournaments that I'm looking forward to the most this year, like, like thing tournaments, I think I can win. So I'm going to Champlain and I'm going to try and win that tournament, mark it down. Like I'm, I, I, that's just how my mentality is going to be. I'm, I'm good. I'm good on the classic, but, and I, I fish like that most all the time anyway, but I'm going there to win. Like, and I, and I may do terrible. I don't know. Um, but I'm not going to worry about angler of the year, rookie of the year. Um, I'm going to go try and win that tournament, win St. Lawrence river. Um, 
and we're going to see what happens, man. So, uh, yeah, it'd be awesome. I mean, you might as well. I mean, win winning seems like yeah. a lot of fun. It it is it is a <laughs> lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. I uh, I I want to do it again. I think I think I have some more in my future, without a doubt. Um, and I I'm really confident right now. I don't want to seem like I'm conceited or anything, but I I just do. I um, I I'm very confident in my fishing, and uh, these next two are are right up my alley. So. Don't you think that's a weird thing that happens in our sport where you have to say that? I don't want to sound conceited or anything, but you know what I mean. If I was talking to you as a pitcher right now. And you're like, man, I am on the top of my game. I am going into these last two games of the season and I want a shutout. I, like, I don't want anyone to hit. You would just be like, I love that pitcher. That's the, what the pitchers. But in fishing, if you say you're on top of your game and you're sweet, you have to kind of backtrack. Why do you think our sport is different that way? Because we're dealing with a fish. <laughs> yeah. fish, fish that swim around and it's, it's way more unpredictable. And there's, there's so many more factors that go in that, you know, you could blow your motor or, or you know what I'm saying? Like there's, there's uh, more things you can't control. So um, I know just as easy as I've won this tournament, the next one at Champlain, I could finish, you know, a hundred. I mean, it's, it's just the reality. And so um, that's, that's the difference, man. You know, when you're, when you're, when I was a pitcher, I had that confidence, like, Hey, I want the ball. Um, I'm going to dominate. And, um, you know, you felt good about it. And I, I feel that way now. Um, absolutely. Yeah. If we were going somewhere else though, you know, I, I may not be as that confident as I am at Champlain and, and St. Lawrence. So, but anyways, feeling good. You also did something that uh, <clears throat> I don't believe has ever been done. Um, or it hasn't been done while I was on stage is you took your winning moment and turned it into the, to be honest, before we get into this, I, I think it's ridiculous how the world has gotten with baby announcements and gender reveals and stuff like that. I mean, it's a theatrical production that people have to do, but you did one of the coolest things ever and took your winning moment to announce in that 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 you're expecting and your family and everybody, nobody knew about it until that moment. How did that go over? Not well, evidently. Evidently, it did not go well because um, there was no answer. Are you back now? I'm back now. I don't know what happened. <laughs> All right. Well, I was asking what I was asking you. I don't know if you heard it, but you did something that I've never seen happen before. And you took your winning moment and announced your baby that you guys are expecting it, to your family. Like nobody knew. Um, how did that go over? And I, all I thought when it came out of his mouth is I know how many texts somebody gets when they announce or when they win an elite series event well i could only imagine how many texts you get when you announce that and that yeah um so the thing is is uh me and my wife you know we've got two we got two girls and uh this was completely like not supposed to happen but it did and um i she you know she hasn't even been to her first doctor visit dave like but but the the word slipped out and like her side of the family knew and my my Gwen my wife she went with my sister they took a pregnancy test together at her house or something and, and she was pregnant for sure so um, I'm excited about it like I love it I'm I'm really hoping to have a boy and it's something we, we've been wanting eventually and so anyways my my wife didn't want me to tell anybody I said listen if I win this thing if I win, happen to win the tournament, I'm going to get on there. My parents, um, they're, you know, obviously big supporters of me and, and our kids and family is huge in my, in my family. And, and so I wanted to surprise them and, um, tell everybody and I, I don't care. I mean, it's a, it's a blessing and, and I, I, you know, might as well put it on stage and shoot, man. Um, cool. I'm, I'm, I love being a dad. It's my, it's my favorite part of life. And, um, you know, do this stuff for my kids and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, one day the, whatever it is, boy or girl, they can look back and, and say, yeah, you know, my dad is now on stage. Yeah. Something cool. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, you got a trophy, one for each kid right now, so you might as well go get a third one this year. So <laughs> I've heard, I've heard that too. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of hype coming into this event about all the Northern anglers and, and lots of them did well, but, but lots of them struggled a lot of hype going into this event about, 
our four Canadian anglers, but Canada still had a piece in this victory, correct? Absolutely. Check this out. Oh, wow. Hat change. Hat change right there. I love, I, so this, the cool story about this hat, Dave, is um, I was at the Classic where Gussie won, and I met some Canadian guys, and they, I talked to them. We had a good time. And this guy, after the, the guys took off, I went down to take off. I was walking back up to my truck uh, with my father-in-law, and one of the Canadian guys, you probably know him. I don't know. Uh, he's just a fan, though. He's there for Gussie, and he ran up to give me this hat. And I thought it was really, I, I thought it was really cool. I always love, uh, I love Canada. I love, I've uh, been up there a couple times hunting and um, that guy was awesome. I don't know his name, but shout out to him. And uh, I won that, that this, this tournament in Canada. Um, I've done well over there, made some money in the past in Canada. And I just, I just love, I, I love St. Clair. And it's just, it's really special to me. This hat right here is, it's funny how I got it. And I thought it was cool to, to throw it on real quick you're from canada and all your all your fans that follow you in canada um i know fishing's big there and and um i just really appreciate the, all the support i've had a lot of canadian people reach out to me in the in the past couple of days so it's cool cool story but why do you think there was less pre i mean canada gets hammered generally in a saint Clair tournament you guys weren't even able to the elite series i mean you weren't on the elite series at the time but the last time we were there they weren't even able to go to canada because of the COVID rules and stuff like that. So everything tells you that Canada should be a major player going into this event. Obviously yeah. it was because it was one there, but a way less pressure than we traditionally see. Why do you think that was this time around? Um, I don't know because the, my, that was my exact logic going into this thing was Canada has to have had a less pressure you know, since with the COVID and it being, um, you know, closed and everything to the, to the, to the Americans. And, um, but the fishing over there, it, it really wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be. I mean, it, I, I checked a lot of areas and, and you can miss fish over there because it's, you know, anywhere on St. Clair, it's so vast, but it, it just wasn't that good. Um, and I just happened to find the, the one little area there that was. Um, so that's, that's what I was thinking on that. It's just the fishing was, wasn't as good, but it worked. <laughs> you, you talk to a lot of pros and they'll tell you that they were catching fish on the Canadian side, but they were, they were smaller. They were just, you know, yeah. they, and that's St. Clair tradition has always been that. I mean, you can literally catch the exact same size fish as far as length and everything goes, but if your fish are eating mayflies and somebody else's fish are eating perch you don't even stand a chance how were you able to key in on i mean you said numbers wasn't always as easy but man they were always big so which is the exact opposite of what every angler that didn't go there was telling me were was it the zone or was it something you were doing no i think it was i think it was the zone for sure i think it was location there um and the, the reason why guys potentially missed the, the place that I found is you would, you would uh, fish for a while and maybe, maybe go 100, 200 yards or 20, 30 minutes, and you wouldn't see a fish to throw at. Um, and, and then you could hit a little flurry, you know, and catch three or four big ones, but like you could have missed this spot so easily. And I just happened to, 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 to I was running my boat across the lake. And, um, I saw some cabbage on my 2d and I, I shut the motor down. That's what I do there. A lot of times when I'm looking for spots and it just happened to be like, you know, my, one of my first, uh, drifts through there, I, I caught a four, you know, and, and then caught some quality fish. So, um, it was just a portion for me, but it, it did, it was a really cool place. It had a lot of perch in it more than I'd seen in other places. And it had the right grass, that, that tall cabbage. And, um, it was just, it was the perfect it was just the perfect storm there, you know, with, with the bait and, and everything. I mean, those, I think those big smallmouth eat those, those perch for sure. And they were, they were really thick there, like really thick. So, yeah. What baits did you use to win this title? Um, the only bait I threw was the Berkeley Max scent flatworm, uh, brown back color. I've, I've done well with that thing. You know, it's not, it's not a secret. I mean, everybody no. knows that it's, it's so good. I mean, if it's probably the, 
the most popular smallmouth bait there is out there. Um, but it works. Uh, it's that simple. And, and that's what I throw. I don't throw, but you know, two colors in that green pumpkin and the brown pack and I catch fish smallmouth everywhere I go on it. And that's, that's, that's what I threw. Um, I didn't catch any fish on anything else at all. It's an incredible bait. I mean, if somebody ever stopped and added up, it, it has to be the millions of dollars that have been won. I mean, it, it from, yeah. and it's only been around, you know, a handful of years, like, I mean, five, six years, I guess now. Um, it, it's phenomenal. Um, but speaking of phenomenal, one of the most phenomenal things that happened, and I know I'm, I am not trash talking you at all here. I think it is the great motivational moment that your day can start a little rough and you could still be an elite series champion at the end of the day at takeoff. You were one of the first boats in the water. I show up and I'm like, like I try to get there, especially on Sunday. I try to get there an hour, hour and 15 minutes before takeoff. Cause I, that's when I like to have real conversations with you guys, like off the microphone and just, it's a cool vibe. You know what I mean? To be down yeah. there. So I noticed you were at the dock and and always a professional. You're always there early to do top baits and everything. So you'd been in the water for at least an hour, I would imagine, when takeoff happened and the fans are cheering and the music is pumping and Luke Palmer leaves. He's their tournament day three leader and you're in second place and you go to back up and then I see a look of terror in your eyes as you realize you cannot trim down because you left <laughs> your motor mate on. Um, I thought about not mentioning it on the mic, but I was like, I bet you can't really hide this. I mean, every fisherman on earth has done that. Every angler has yeah. left their plug out or done that. But not everyone's done it at an elite series event. What was going through your mind when you were leaned over to the back deck of your boat, removing your motor mate? <laughs> I was thinking, like, I am the most, I'm just the biggest idiot there is, Dave. <laughs> I'm serious. You're in the elite series, the biggest tournament you could be, you know, tournament series you could be in. And I pull one of those. And yeah, I've done it before, but I'm, I'm really kind of a scatterbrain guy. I mean, I, I, I do stuff like that all the time. So, um, but, but no, I was, I, I, I was very embarrassed. Um, and I got down there. I said, you know what? It's not, it's going to hurt me. You know, it's not going to cost me an hour or something. So I just <laughs> trimmed her up and reached down there and pulled it off. Luckily it's very easy to get to on my boat. Um, and then we, we got out of there, but but yeah, it's it's so funny that I did that on championship day, man. So funny. <laughs> Any other day, you might have been able to get away with it. You know what I mean? Like because there's so many other boats moving, but um, <laughs> hey, it happens to everybody. It has happened to everybody. It happens <laughs> to me way too much. Um, I mean, KJ Queen once forgot to put gas in on his very yeah. first championship Sunday. And the kicker of that story that he since told me and didn't tell me on the podcast, but so he sat there again. It was his first top 10 and he was jacked to go. And he was one of the first in the water. And then when he went to leave, he realized, wow, I have no gas. Um, but the kicker about it, he said he stopped at like five or six gas stations on the way to take off. I guess he gets a biscuit every morning before competition. And nobody <laughs> yeah. had a biscuit. So he literally, he said him pulling in and he said to make matters worse, he said, it's, you know, it's, Five o'clock in the morning, there's nobody around. It's a Sunday and five o'clock in the morning. So he's ripping into these gas stations, parking at the pump. They're so dead. Like, you know what I mean? He's just pulling up, running in. You got any biscuits? Not once did he stop to pump gas. So it's, uh, wow. it happens to everybody. Yeah. But man, what you did does not happen to everybody. It It's so incredible, regardless of how this season ends. And, and the scary thing is, like you said, you're going to try win the next two, but man, you're a two time elite series champion. Um, it, it's just unbelievable, dude. And it's, it's the coolest thing about my job is getting to see the evolution of, of pros, you know, as these opportunities and as they, I mean, this isn't an opportunity that, that came to you lightly. You've worked for this your whole life. Um, it's been awesome to watch and I, and I can't wait to watch the rest of the season. Dave, it's, it's been a pleasure, man. Uh, I, my experience this year on the Bassmaster Elite Series has been phenomenal. Everybody from, from you yelling at my face, announcing me on stage is my, is I just get like, I get chill bumps when you do that, man. It, it's really, it almost makes me want to cry. Like I, 
the but all the people that work at Bath, um, they're just so courteous. They go above and beyond to take care of us elite guys. And uh, you guys put on an amazing tournament. Um, and I couldn't be more thankful, man. I, I, I look forward to, to many more years to come and, and uh, seeing you spit in my face yelling at me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's uh, They posted a video of that this weekend. I, I mean, I, to be honest, I always kind of liked it that nobody saw it. You know, for the longest time, nobody ever saw it but the anglers. But people yeah. have got kind of wind of what that happens. But, dude, it's one of the most fun things for me is the job. And guys like you make it fun. And everybody kind of saw that video. And if you haven't, go to Bass's social media and check it out. But I love to, you know, because because I always tell people there's different people. There's some anglers that just like go into shell, put their head down and kind of they almost can't look at you. There's some that like stare right in your eyes. And my favorite are the ones like you that are like, come on, give it to me. Because, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which just makes it even more fun. So I hope to yell in your face for many, many years to come. What's one thing? Nobody knows about this tournament that happened to you that you can tell me. Um, this shoot, is not a good way to end, Joey. I know it's silent. Um, Dave, I don't know. Um, honestly, don't know. If I hear one of them, if I hear some little nugget that you bring up on a podcast, I am going to. It's hard when you for a different reason when I see it's you. hard when you put me on the spot like that and ask me. Um, I know, I know, I know there was something, guys, because I did the motor tote thing. <laughs> and, oh uh, well, no, that's um, no nah, nothing, nothing like crazy weird or or anything like that, man. Um, just a just a super emotional. Um, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you one thing. And this isn't goofy or anything, but when when we came into the way in the last day, uh, you know, we were we were idling in. Uh, my cameraman, you know, when I caught that I caught that last big one or the one that jumped in the boat, I said uh, I said to my dad, or I I said, you know, this one's for you, Dad, for taking me fish when I was a kid. Uh, my cameraman, he he got emotional. We we cried together. Uh, he, I don't know what he has been through with his his dad, but. My dad's had a, a rough go like the last couple a couple of years. He was dealing with some cancer stuff, but he's he's doing really good now. And um that moment right there, man, when he asked me that, like and us us really, you know, crying together, like it's it's I'll never forget that moment. Um my dad means a lot to me and and uh this tournament was for him. So uh that's that's it. I'll I'll quit getting sobby, but but that's no. that's a cool moment that that I I, I will never forget, Dave. No, that's a very cool moment, and it's a very cool opportunity for you to be able to publicly express that towards your dad and all the dads that take people fishing, and how cool yeah. is it that it happened just a few hours ago, a few hours before you got an opportunity to announce to the world that you were once again going to be a dad. And uh, yeah. dude, you're a great dad, a great person, and a great Elite Series champion. And um, I was trying to rally to get Kid Rock to actually show up and sing your song since we were in Detroit. I mean, Man, Zoda is awesome. basically <laughs> Detroit loyalty. He could not pull it off, evidently. But uh, but you did, dude. And um, Angler of the Year and Rookie of the Year, you think? Might as well. Let's try it. <laughs> we will see. Lots of fishing left to come, Joey Cifuentes. I thank you for spending a little time with me. Any plans to celebrate this week? Or has the celebration already happened? Uh, we did a little celebrating. I don't know if you've seen the video of my uh, my two girls, girls there. Yeah, yeah, they were doing a little dancing. Uh, Wednesday, I'm going to go with the the what we call the Poker Palace, a big group of guys that that's been supporting me and Larry since we started fishing, and uh, so we're going to go celebrate with them and and have a good time and and uh, go out to eat. I'm sure my whole family and everybody's going to get together one day. We hadn't done that yet, but but yeah, there'll there'll be some celebrating. But we uh, we got to get back to work. I got one more question since you brought up the Poker Palace. What did Larry say to you? And Larry, if you heard him respond, a reference to him earlier, his travel partner, Larry, is none other than Larry Nixon, the general. What did he say to you? Um, you know, he, he just told me good job. Uh, he Actually, what he did was he told me, he said, Joey, I'm leaving in the morning. He left Sunday morning. He said, I don't want to stay. I do want to stay really bad, and I want to see you win this tournament because I think you're going to. 
but I'm going to leave because I did one time um, I did this to George Cochran because he used to r- travel with George Cochran and he stayed and he felt like he jinxed George and he didn't end up winning the tournament. And so he left and, um, and, but anyways, he called me and, and congratulated me and just told me how proud he was of me. Uh, you know, that's uh, pretty, pretty cool. Very cool. We're all proud of you and uh, can't wait to, Watch the next chapters of your story unfold. Two-time Elite Series champion, Joey Cifuentes. No, we made it. We made it. I get it. It was a long one, but we made it all the way to the end. And it was all goodness, I believe. Um, Great conversations. And I always say you can't put a limit on a good conversation. And, well, if you're still listening to this, clearly you agree. And I thank you guys. Week in, week out, you guys are awesome. Over 230 thousand subscribers on youtube streaming services blow up every single week you guys are awesome and i thank you for everything that you give to this show you guys support it you guys watch it you guys comment you guys help it be what it is and you guys also you know encourage the pros to go on i mean i can't the amount of feedback that pros give me after shows is awesome so thank you thank you all for making um this weird little thing i do a pretty cool thing. It's a great life, and I hope you're having a good week. Enjoy being, and um, as always, Bob Cop, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe, because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?